welcome everybody and uh, it's a nice uh, Sunday, uh, nice sunny day outside and still guys decided to come for a lecture and uh, after moving to Florida everybody would like not to miss a sunny hour. It's a beautiful day outside and I'm glad uh, all the people came. Last time was an interesting topic, it was uh, smoking and peripheral vascular disease. A lot of people doesn't want to admit that they're smokers so they decided not to sign up. Once I took the smoking off, just we put peripheral vascular disease <laughs> and the attendant shows up. And <laughs> it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. The first word smoking put off all the smokers out of the picture. It's almost uh, uh, peripheral vascular disease 10 years ago, even when I, when I was in medical school, we never thought that it's such an important topic. Uh, as, as we all pass the age of 50, happens to be uh, worldwide, it's an, a pandemic of vascular disease in the lower extremities. 17% of the population after age 50. So that translates to, you know, two out of 10 people. And uh, that's a lot. That's, you're talking about millions of people have the peripheral vascular disease. But one good thing is everybody does not have a severe peripheral vascular disease. Some people have clogged arteries severe to the extremes and some people have a mild plaque buildup in the arteries. If a physician says you have a peripheral vascular disease, I don't think you guys have to panic about it. When we do ultrasounds, we see a lot of plaque buildup in the arteries. A mild form of peripheral vascular disease can be well managed with the medications. Everybody does not need a stent. So having said that, we'll see some of the pictures might be extreme forms of peripheral vascular disease don't get don't get too much worried about looking at your legs and uh, thinking, you know, something bad going to happen. And, uh, and of course, all vascular disease is connected to smoking and uh, uh, few of the slides, few of the slides might be related to smoking because I was preparing a lecture for smoking and peripheral vascular disease. Unfortunately, it's a smoker's disease. It does happen in other people, but smokers more common. And, uh, the way the plaque builds up is these are the healthy arteries. Uh, the blood flow is you can see the plaque build up like this on ultrasounds. Simple ultrasound technology, you can find out the plaque build up in the arteries up to the below the knees. You might not able to see in the foot area, but you can see the thigh and uh, below the knee joint. You can see the plaque build up in the arteries. Um, and this is the mechanism where cholesterol plaque gradually builds up and then it pushes into the wall, and then slowly the narrowing. And this is, this is the similar plaque in the coronaries. When you see if it is in the leg arteries, if the same plaque is in the coronaries, so it's a systemic disease. When people have a lower extremity disease, the first thing we worry is when they lose pulses, I'm worried about the legs, but I'm more worried about the heart because it goes in conjunction. And uh, the numbers are overall population, I mentioned 17 to 18 percent. And if they have diabetes, look at the numbers, 30 percent. So there are 10 to 20 million people projected in the next 10, 20 years to add on to the diabetes population. It's very easy, just little sedentary lifestyle and aging, we end up having type 2 diabetes. It does not take much. So the population with the peripheral vascular disease will be 30%. And without diabetes, you get lucky. You matched with the normal population. I think this population is probably a little bit of smokers here. That's why the number higher than the diabetes. And uh, the natural progression, first healthy artery, nicely. We all born with these arteries. And between aging and uh, misuse, we build up these plaques between the diet and smoking and hypertension, high cholesterol, the plaque builds up and you make this plaque, there's a cap around it, it's called fibrous cap. The cap keeps this plaque stable. On a bad day, the cap, it's almost like a expulsion, it's like a opening of the cap where all this material gets into the circulation and clogs the artery. It could be coronary, it could be the leg, but whenever this table plaque suddenly ruptures, that's where it translates into an acute emergency. 
again the plaque build up in the artery and uh, differentiation of severe plaque and if the narrowing gets when we use the word 60 percent 70 percent we put stents we don't put stents when it's 30 percent this is the measurement inside the cavity okay from the normal artery so and there is a tear in the wall and the plaque builds up into fatty material builds up and the fatty material here is the plaque breaking into the artery and once it breaks into the artery all the fat comes in it and it combines with the blood and you get a fresh clot so if this is in the coronary it's a heart attack but if it is in the leg it's an ischemic limb it's a life-threatening emergency where you potentially could lose the limb so you have to suck out this clot if you suck out this clot and put a stent then everything is back to normal So the symptoms, what you look for, and uh, typically, you know, a lot of people complain of multiple symptoms. At sometimes, some are, some people can have one of these symptoms and may not have peripheral vascular disease. But symptoms typically are cold feet and pale discoloration of the skin, loss of hair on the legs, and uh, that's like silently they lose most of the hair in the shin area. And uh, of course, this is an extreme form. By the time you get wound care center for wound cleaning, that's, that's a severe form of peripheral vascular disease. Or the wounds do not heal properly. And uh, in men, erectile dysfunction is one of the symptoms of peripheral vascular disease. It's not always, but it's connected to the vascular disease. <laughs> this is, I think, most of the people here will belong to one of this. But if you see, first one is blood pressure, second one is cholesterol, third one is a good cholesterol, fourth one is diabetes, fifth one is cigarette smoking, and the last one is on echocardiograms, an ultrasound of the heart, we look for thickening of the heart muscle. If you see this, if somebody has all the six of these, then their chances of having heart disease and peripheral vascular disease jumps to 60%. If they have few of them, four, five, as they have none, this is a healthy population here. 120 blood pressure, little bit cholesterol, and good cholesterol is good, 50. 50 is a magic number for good cholesterol. They don't have diabetes, they don't have smoking, they don't have any thickening of the heart muscle seem close to healthy population, a little bit of cholesterol, their estimated risk is here. And that gradually, you add on one more, one more, one more risk factor, jumps to here. So we wanted to keep patients here, but this is the high risk population where they needed more aggressive treatments. So a lot of peripheral vascular disease patients, they might not come with complaining about the lower extremity symptoms. They can have vascular dementia, memory issues, dizziness, and they have uh, TIA, stroke symptoms. There's a lot of symptoms are connected to the peripheral vascular disease. So some of generalized symptoms I mentioned here. And uh, the discoloration is typically starts in the foot, in the dorsum of the foot, and you see the loss of hair in the lower extremities. And uh, whenever you guys go to the physician, the best thing is to ask him any signs of peripheral vascular disease. This takes quick, quick eyeballing the legs and for, you know, feeling the pulses. Every time you might not need a very sophisticated test, but simple, simple evaluation can tell at least you have or you do not have a significant disease. And um, <clears throat> see, if you watch carefully, you see some discoloration of the fourth toe. So that's, that's losing almost blood supply completely. So that will terminate into a amputation of the partial toe and then slowly the, so these are the symptoms you have to be careful. Again, small ulcer, they get an antibiotic, does not heal. And they get a second course of antibiotic, does not heal. And at that point they say, you know, maybe you should check for a vascular disease. 
And uh, when, when you do ultrasounds, these people have 80, 90 percent clogged arteries. Once they get recirculation build up, the healing gets better. <clears throat> so between the talk, any questions, you guys can stop me. Um, some of uh, poor non-healing ulcers, and uh, some are extreme forms of peripheral vascular disease. That's why I told, like, if you see this, don't get overwhelmed. Oh, my God. This is, we, we do not see this. Wound care centers see this. We do not allow our patients to get to this point, okay? So we don't see this. Wound care centers, yes, you know, there are people who are not being checked before. Um, this is an extreme form, sudden onset gangrene and a lack of blood supply to all the toes. And this, by this stage, most of the people will end up having partial amputations. Um, this is a smoker's disease. If, when, if you are not familiar with the word, Burger's disease, in a young people, 40s, 50s, they lose their upper extremities, lower extremities. It is funny, some people smoke for whole life and uh, nothing major happens to their vascular system. And a few people by age 40s, they lose their legs and toes. And that's a very sensitive to smoking. And that's the disease called Burger's disease. We see like almost Burger's disease patients in you know, medical school here and there. We do not see too many, but there are some patients with a Burger's disease who lost their extremities, their wheelchair bound at young age. And typically when you do angiograms, put a dye in their arteries and look, you see the total loss of circulation. This is in the hand. You can imagine how much of destruction smoking can cause to the distal parts of the arteries. This is an interesting thing where when patients, when 100 patients have peripheral vascular disease with the pain in the calf muscles when they walk, for every 100 people, another 100 patients, they're not going to the physician. So once we have 100 patients, there are 400 other patients who are not getting medical attention. So this is one of the popular you know, published article where they're saying 300 patients were walking around and another 100 patients, they're ignoring the symptoms. So this 100 patients go to the physician and get attention. So that's the reason we thought, you know, peripheral vascular disease, we need to reach the community and educate the community. And if, you, if somebody complains about symptoms, they need to be aware that there's something, some treatment options are available. So every 100 patients, there are 400 patients sitting there not getting attention. That's a lot. Only 20% are getting there. Once they get to the physician, see what happens to most of them. Significant people from here 16 cardiac deaths, four strokes, and seven non-vascular deaths. Around 30% 30, 30 of these 100, 30 will die within five years because of the cardiac problems, the connection between the lower extremities and the heart disease. And if they go for the leg, it's not like everybody goes. Only people five out of this population will end up having stents put in or something major happening to them. And 75, they improve, improve their symptoms with the revascularization. And uh, a quarter of these patients will deteriorate. So you can help significant people, 75%, you can improve here. And you can prevent this 30% deaths and strokes by intervening at the earlier stage with a certain medication, simple things, blood pressure control, cholesterol control, making them quit smoking. So one of the simple measure, I'm sure most of the people here at Lifetime had one time or the other time checking the blood pressure in the arms, and we check the blood pressure at the ankles. This actually, we wanted to have almost like a screening in our office. At some point, we might assign a person just to do on everybody who comes, not every visit, once a year to do the ankle brachial index. You, by checking the blood pressures in the upper extremities and lower extremities, you see the ratio. It gives you the numbers here. If the pressure there, pressure here is good, comparable, that means they don't have a severe disease. Let's say the pressure here is half of the pressure here, they have a severe moderate to severe disease in the legs. It's a very simple blood pressure measurements in the upper extremities and the lower. 
without any sophisticated MRIs, without anything, you can tell at least they have a bad disease or they don't have significant disease. We might not be able to tell if there is a mild plaque or not. For that, you need to go to the second step, which is an ultrasound. And an ultrasound, what we do is the technicians who do an echoes, they are well trained to do look at the legs. So they put the color dye and they look at the plaque. And this blackened area is the plaque. And on, on real ultrasounds, it looks shiny, darkened plaque. And the remaining is the blood supply to the lower extremity. So you see the plaque here? See the blood coming down? This is all the plaque. So, and this is, if you, if you take the measurement of this, this corresponds to 70%. Of course, on ultrasounds, it gives an adjustment. It's not an accurate. You have to do an angiogram to find out. So when you do an angiogram, we, we put a catheter in the aorta. Sometimes we do this even when we're doing the heart catheterization. If we suspect that they have a vascular disease, we put a catheter here and just shoot the dye. See the dye goes down this way? And this is going to the left leg. And what's happening to the right? So nothing there. So you have long blockage here and long blockage from there to there. And there is a tight blockage here, moderate blockage here, and no blood supply going down. And the, on the left-hand side, you see a small plaque here. But the flow is good. The, the dark is the dye. Lack of darkness is lack of dye. No blood flow there. And this is in the legs. You see that there is no connection between here to here. It's complete lack of blood supply there. You wanted to see something like this. This is normal. This is completely lack of blood supply here. See that? How the dark tunnel, it's nothing here. So the, we came along, a lot of progress happened in the peripheral vascular disease. It used to be a surgeon's disease, almost like 20 years ago, 15 years ago, everything is surgical. You have to go take the plaque out, incise the artery, and take the plaque out. And if needed, you put a bypass graft. But nowadays, these things are rare. You do not really send surgically. 80, 90% of the cases are done through the interventions. And uh, even for the aneurysms, all these, once you have a clogged arteries in the legs, immediately we are not, even though we take care of the legs, we are thinking of the heart. These people have 15, 20 percent of them have abdominal aneurysms. See, look at the normal iota, straight. If you measure it, it's 2.5 centimeters, 3 centimeters. Once it's crossed two and a half, three, it's an aneurysm. And this is an abdominal aneurysm. This is a kidney artery going. Just below the kidney artery, you see the. And this is used to be a surgical treatment, too. And now, no surgery for this. You put a stent graft from above, and the blood can flow through the kidney arteries through the struts. And from there, you sealed off, and the blood goes there. So this, this this is done by interventional radiologists and interventional cardiologists. So the surgeon's role of aneurysm is much, much less now, unless it is a very big aneurysm. And if it is, if it involves from there to here, some, sometimes you have to send for surgery because they are not suitable candidates for stent grafts. And uh, this is a patient who had a severe peripheral vascular disease with an aneurysm. It looks like that after the procedure. So typically, if the people are not candidate for any, any stents, they, the, they get a bypass graft. If the blockage is here, it's very simple. Like you bypass from there to there. If the, if the blockage is here, this is in the leg at the knee level. Then you bypass from the femoral artery down to the below the knee. Just it's above the knee, a superficial femoral artery. You bypass from there to here. 
If the blockage is here, sometimes you block, you cannot do here to here. You can go from the right side to left side graft. Once you have a surgical graft, you resume the circulation, you avoid ulceration in the feet, and you avoid all the complications of you know, losing the leg. But uh, this, I can tell that now with all the interventions, surgical procedures are probably 15, 20 percent go for surgery, 80 percent do not go for surgery. These are the surgical grafts. So just you suture it, you make a nick there and suture it, and you go there and nick there and suture it. And from surgery to stents, and the peripheral interventions have become more and more popular in the last as last six to seven years, more and more. They have all sorts of balloons. You can push the plaque to the wall and then deploy a stent. And the stent exactly looks like this. It is the same as coronary stent, but bigger size. What you get for the heart stents are same. They exactly look like this, but they are bigger in the legs. And the balloon comes out. Once you push the stent into the wall, the balloon comes out. And they have memory issues, of course. And uh, a few comments about, unfortunately, the children are exposed to a lot of, lot of uh, smoking at younger age. I think uh, when I see peripheral vascular disease, a lot of people here, their blood pressure control well, their cholesterol is well, they take medicines. You are much lower risk compared to young smokers who are on the this is smoking extensively, and they are exposing their children to secondhand smoking. And uh, when I saw this slide, I was like, 25% of children live at least one smoker in the family. That's a lot of exposure to secondhand smoking. And this is this is another, you know, the bothersome numbers for the future. 60% of US children aged 3 and 11, that's 22 million children are ex exposed to secondhand smoking. So if you're a grandparent, please educate them. I think it's, it's going to have indirect effect on the children. Um, the sudden deaths from smoking and the vascular disease is 150 to 300,000 sudden deaths. And it, it, it's including, you know, infections, vascular disease, smoking ban will kill my business. <laughs> and in front of him, he has this. <laughs> and uh, of course, this is the number one culprit for vascular disease. And number two common is the blood pressure. It does not hurt if your blood pressure is elevated today, just one day, don't get panicked. But in the long run, if you leave it alone, uncontrolled, months and years, that's what it damage, similar damage what the smoking can cause to the vascular system. And this one is diabetes. I think this one is going to be the, in the future, this one is probably here, the smoking will go down to three. And this one, I don't know. <laughs> this is the, this is very tempting, you know, even, uh, this is, this is end of the day, I think we're all human beings here and there. We got to eat some you know, French fries, otherwise French fries business will be out of business. <laughs> but uh, this one, a high consumption of this. This morning, I, I was rounding in Leesburg Hospital. The two, three patients came with heart failure. I, I always ask how much salt they eat, and uh, I always ask about soups and uh, French fries. Those two things, they all ordered that almost every week, they have enough soups and at least once or twice French fries. And, uh, and once they have a congestive heart failure, if they're still consuming French fries, I think it's, it's something, uh, something either they didn't get the message right or they've never been told that it's, it's no, no, no. And uh, when the plaque builds up and we all misuse, this is, this is the plaque when sucked out of the artery. Um, <coughs> so, when people have a sudden, sudden vascular deaths, these are the clogged arteries, and this is the heart muzzle. See the ischemic muzzle this much? The muzzle damage is very low here, but this can cause electrical problem and cause sudden cardiac arrest. It doesn't take much. <coughs> uh, this, 
this is all part of our life. So between a between a nice TV channel and uh, double burgers and fries and uh, n invention of human beings and uh, between a stress on the road and worries, I think we're all exposed to some type of vascular disease, stress, diet, smoking, sedentary lifestyle. Uh, and then symptoms and so this is the this is the typical sudden this is exactly happens when they have artery clogs the myocardium nice juicy bloody surface here suddenly getting ischemic no blood flow to that area so this is all we need to do and this is a golden years at villages this is if you live close to the beach you are in trouble <laughs> uh, so a lot of some of the slides here i will quickly cruise through these are the testing we can do without going through catheterizations with the ct you can find out with the ct's mris you can find out clogged arteries in the neck and the leg rarely you do need to do an angiogram by the time you go for an angiogram in the legs you are almost certain that there is a clogged artery and you are looking for a stent. And the new technologies, you can just see how the beautiful the artery is coming down, coming down. Here, you do not see the blood supply at all. So, and uh, some of the comparison, even dementia in smokers and non-smokers, we will uh, skip few slides, then we will go to peripheral vascular disease. So a lot of exercise prevention takes a major role. And uh, this is the area where the plaque build up. And this is the catheter with uninflated balloon. And this is the catheter with inflated balloon. So this is what happens when somebody rushes to the hospital with an acute emergency for the heart attack. The catheter, there's a plaque buildup in here. Then the catheter goes with the uninflated balloon. Once you cross, you inflate the balloon. And everything, all plaque is built up, pushed into the side. So some of the some of the techniques um, are changing for the vascular disease. It used to be a bigger sheets and bigger catheters. People used to stay in the hospital for three days. Now everything is a minimal uh, trauma to the entry place. So if you are entering the artery in the leg or the radial artery, the sheets are much smaller. This is the size of the sheath. So this sheath goes into the artery. This is into the rest. And if you're going through the groins, the catheter goes from the groin down to the arch. And if you're going down the leg, you go from this side to this side and shoot the die. And you go from the left to the right and shoot the die. I'll show some pictures of the real angiograms. This is a radial procedure. The needle goes in. Once the blood comes out, then you put a wire and uh, leave, a, leave a sheath. And this is the needle. And uh, the procedure is done right at the, at the wrist. So once the blood returns, you put a little wire in through this. And then this is the sheath. So everything, every, all the work is done through the sheath, and then the sheath comes out. So these are the big smoking uh, ads and interesting stuff. And uh, hopefully, if somebody smokes here, please do not get offended. So please work on cutting down. And. Uh, I think this slide uh, I prepared for the last class, but uh, he got in. I could not throw this slide out of my. Like, I, even for me, 
I did not know that the cadmium, I thought it is only in the batteries and stuff, it gets into the cigarettes. So, used in batteries. So, how many chemicals here? Just one side was not enough, they had to put on two sides. And, uh, and I wish they put these things in the gas stations instead of putting those nice ads, you know, two for one. I was filling the gas tank in uh, villages, two for one. I said, what is this two for one? It's a cigarette boxes. If you buy one second, one free. Yeah. And advanced imaging, nowadays with advanced imaging, you can see the clogged artery. See this here compared to here. So, without any trauma, just through putting the dye and you are getting an MR imaging or scintigraphy or CT, you can, you can see how the blocked arteries are. So, here, see the clogged artery there and here complete loss of blood flow to the limb, complete loss of blood flow to the limb. And by the time patients come in here to the lab, it gets very expensive. Hospitals, forty, thirty thousand dollars to get these procedures done, and the future of Medicare is going to be uh, difficult for them to treat millions of people with expensive procedures. I think the prevention, prevention makes the more. By the time they come to the hospital, either they are very sick or they require very intense procedures. So, simple measures of you know measuring their blood pressures in the upper lower extremities and screening them at younger age at earlier stage and preventing them with proper medicines is the key. <coughs> this is the arterial system, this is the venous system. And this is the just for if you guys curious what arteries go into the artery, the big one coming is a femoral artery and the in the in the ankle, in the knee level, it is called popliteal artery, then it branches into three branches here, one, two, three. One good thing is, if one gets clogged, you know, luckily God has given an extra artery where you can still have circulation. So, somebody, some people can have one artery clogged and still can develop collaterals. So, patients say, I have made my own bypasses. This, this is the way you make one bypasses. If one gets clogged, the second one helps the first one. So, that is why you can be walking around with a significant peripheral vascular disease not having pain. But if you go and check it out with the blood pressures, your blood pressures will be low on the legs. <clears throat> so, a lot of patients are asymptomatic. A lot of people with the peripheral vascular disease, they do not have symptoms. Some have limb ischemia, is almost like threatening life, uh, sudden loss of blood supply to the limb with a severe pain. And many people can have a claudication, which is when you walk, the pain comes. When you stop, the pain goes away. There is a second type of claudication, because a lot of people have a back issues, you need to differentiate between claudication which is from the circulation, there is something called pseudo claudication. What happens is the spinal canal gets narrow, you get the pain in the legs. That is why when we go to the shopping carts, we bend. We bend and go, you feel better. And when you straight and go, you get worse in the legs. That is coming from the back. And if somebody says that is coming from the legs and they want to just check the legs, just get that attention from the back. So, there is a difference. Lot of that is a word pseudo claudication. Pseudo means it is not real. Claudication is pain in the legs. So, it is a pseudo claudication, it is a, a back problem, it is not the leg problem. So, leg problem, classic claudication you need to learn from this lecture is if you walk, the pain comes in the calf or the thigh. When you stop, you do not need to sit. If you stop, within a minute, two minutes, three minutes, the pain goes away. The mechanism is the blood, the muscles can handle until at certain level. Once they do not get enough blood, they start aching. And once you are resting for three minutes, the, the blood is getting into the muscles, the oxygenation is adequate, the pain slowly goes away. That is a claudication. Pseudo claudication is back, you almost have to sit 
If you sit only, you get better. Or you got to bend. That's pseudo clarkish. See the difference in the color? Yeah. So it's always compare one, one side to the other side. That's the easiest thing you can do among yourselves. So which one is good? The, good question. The right one is good. Turning pale. Turning pale. So pale. pale. No blood. And uh, this is an extreme form of, you know, this is at the wound care centers. They do the debridement. Um, so among all the people, I think, if you just wanted to check where you stand of developing vascular disease, smokers are the highest. Diabetes is match with the smokers. If somebody is a smoker and a diabetic, that's, you know, the, you know, you cannot be, you can be a smoker and get lucky in life, but you can be diabetic and get lucky. If you have both, you cannot, you know, trust on that luck too much. So it's, it's a double whammy there. These other things are, unfortunately, this is not, you know, hypertension comes with aging. And uh, by age 60, 60% 60 of population, six out of 10 have some hypertension, little bit of blood pressure. By age 70, seven out of 10. By age 80, eight out of 10. So hypertension is inevitable. The way we live between a stress and between uh, diet and between sedentary lifestyles, aging, hypertension is something we all probably, some people get disappointed when they were told that they have high blood pressure. Because I think I almost consider it as a part of, part of the life hypertension at some point. If somebody is lucky who don't have hypertension in this group, they are lucky ones. High cholesterol, this is again modifiable risk factor. You can just fix these things. And uh, this one used to be a big homocysteine in the blood. We used to check for many years. Recently, it's becoming a very expensive test and they routinely do not recommend. Unless if somebody is a 40 or 50 year old, they're having a vascular disease, then we are looking for zebras. Uh, something else is going wrong here. If they're not a smoker, not a diabetic, now no blood pressure, but they get clogged arteries, we look for this homocysteine. If somebody comes to my office, they say that they had a heart attack in 40s and they, they are not smokers, then I check for this. And if, if a young people who are not smokers get a blocked arteries in the leg, we look for this. At, for your age population, we don't check homocysteine levels. C-reactive protein. It's one of the blood test marker, and American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association recommends. And then it became a very popular, and then become less, less popular. Again, we use not on everybody. If people do not want to take cholesterol medicine, I use this. And if it is very high, at least you educate them that I think it's good to be on medicine. People who are already on medicines taking cholesterol medicines, there is no need for checking the. These are expensive tests, so there is some kind of pressure from insurance industry not to check on everybody. But same token, it, they have a significant role in finding out. Somebody at younger age, something bad happened, stroke at 40, and he comes to you at age 50, then if you find the problem and you treat it adequately, you, you prevent future strokes. Um, some of the procedures being a peripheral vascular disease topic, and you see uh, the normal blood flow there, how the tapering the blood flow is. This is this is the aorta. This is your right leg, and this is the left leg. Does anybody can notice how severe this is? And uh, so this, this gentleman will have not able to walk a few feet, severe pain in the legs. And if it, in male, because the lack of blood supply, they usually have a severe sexual dysfunction. And uh, either they can present with leg pain or new onset sexual dysfunction, or they do not go either a stroke or a heart attack. 
because this form, if when you see this much here, you have to assume that it is built up in other arteries too. Uh, and uh, it does not spare any arteries, even though it is a, we use the word peripheral vascular disease. Once you have a peripheral vascular disease, you have a central vascular disease. It can clog the artery going down to the left arm. This is a subclavian artery, supposed to be like this until here and it is clogged from there to there. So, this can be stented, you can put a stent from there to here. And uh, if you pay attention here, this is a nice, this is the way arteries should look, smooth, yeah. very smooth. This is all bulgy, that is a plaque. Smooth is a healthy artery. The bulgy is the plaque build up inside, but see what is happening here. So, it is a severe. Uh, this is in the one of the thigh arteries, superficial femoral artery in the thigh. And see that is the balloons for the, for the legs, the, the balloons are much longer. You can inflate the balloon in the oval artery from there to here. And the stents are also much longer, you can put a big. And the blood flow is so good to the legs, they do not suddenly clog like in the heart. So, they do not need to be on Plavix for rest of the life. You just give a few weeks of Plavix and you can stop the Plavix. And this is, well, even though you do the balloon stents, it is not like a cosmetology. It gets nice, beautiful after. The goal is to just restore blood. The goal is not to make them look pretty. The goal is to restore blood. The, to, to make them look pretty is only by prevention. Okay. So even and if you go to this one, right? You do the ballooning. You still have the narrowing, right? So this is somebody with the right iliac disease. Means right side just above the groin. See this lumpy, bumpy and lumpy, bumpy and suddenly you see this? This is almost 70, 80 percent compared. Whenever we use the percentage 70 percent, 80 percent, you compare with the other area. So, if you take the measurement of this and you measure this and it is a, it's a ball point 70, 80, 60, 70, 80 is almost like when they have a pain in the leg when you see this you are going to say that that is enough to do something about it. That is why by the time you go for an angiogram, they have lot of symptoms in the legs, claudication pain. Then the balloon goes, typically what happens is if you have a clogged artery in the right, this is the right side. So, if it is in the right side, you going from the left, going from the left and the wire crosses and then the stent goes there and the wire from the left leg is coming. So, that is why you should get enough information through non-invasive imaging, either CT or MRI. You already know that the blockage is on the right, so you go from the left. If you know that the blockage is on the left, you go from the right to get fixed. From the same side, you cannot get fixed. So, you get the wire crossed and wire crosses and then the balloon and stent goes there and that is after. So, if you go back, this is before, this is after. And you still see a little bit nick that is a calcium that is like a roughened artery. So, you will not make 100 percent improvement in the arteries. So, this is on the left side now. See the, the balloon going through over the wire. It gets inflated, the stent gets deployed then it looks like this. So, even after the procedure is done, you will see this narrowings 30 percent, 20 percent. So, but in a big picture, the goal is to restore the blood supply. Simple things like, you know, checking the pulse. If you can feel the pulse, that means the strong pulse, that means the, you know, it is not too bad. 
So we do not want to wait until we lose the pulse. And uh, we can do a lot of preventative stuff. And once you go to the ambulance and the hospital, and uh, I don't think anybody will be happy waiting five hours in the, in the emergency room. So simple things can be done as a prevention. And uh, of course, this, this is what they were serving in this morning, this afternoon in Leesburg Hospital. So that was good. And uh, of course, plenty of wine in this town. <laughs> I don't need to recommend an extra wine. <laughs> and we say no to this. And good thing it's no to wine? No to, the, no to the cigarettes. Well, the cigarettes. cigarettes. About the wine. Of course, you need to. Actually, you know what? Uh, the recommend it's a good question is is the wine good or should we? We all consume wine. The recommendations by American Heart Association is if people had stents, coronary disease, previous heart attack, strongly recommend to take one or two glasses of, up to two is the max, of uh, any form of, it could be wine, it could be red, it used to be red wine, slowly it got into other alcohols also. The disadvantages are beer, it adds more calories. So you have to be careful if you are consuming a lot of calories already, the alcohol adds to the calories. So, but what happened is by recommending people to take alcohol, few of them became chronic alcoholics. So, so the final Final print of recommendation is if the patients are well educated, smart people, tell them to take alcohol. If they are tendency of misusing it, for that population actually you do harm as a physician by telling them drink alcohol and make them, few, few of them become alcoholics, you haven't done any favor to anybody. So it's a careful guidelines. That's why you don't see any physicians telling them go, go drink some wine, but it is, for a vascular patients, I think it's, it should, it's a good thing. It's my children in the school here, that's what uh, keeps, keeps us here in this town. They're end of the day tired with mommy, all three boys. And uh, this is once in a while to get out of the town, they love to go to the beach. And, uh, and one of my, all three of my sons, they ride uh, horses. So this once in a while I get to get to the Fruitland Park the horse riding place, and uh, and uh, if you all, so traveling to India is the very difficult, very long journey, long flights, and if you haven't seen a Taj Mahal, and uh, just cruise through Google images, just the images of Taj Mahal, probably get you know 40, 50 images, and they're really beautiful. And uh, those days there were no engineers, and I cannot still think in. 400, 500 years ago, how, how they built this. And now, now to build a 40, 50 floor building in India, it still gets hard. And those days they built Taj Mahal, and still for me, it's a mind boggling thing. I thought. Um, Did you live close to that? Uh, two hour flight. Two hours? Uh, two and a half hours. So. Could this be evaluated by a cardiologist or could we raise that? A question here is, this can be evaluated by a cardiologist or internist could do it. Um, to, be, to be honest, any physician or anybody who knows, and a, and a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, by paying attention to the symptoms, paying attention to the symptoms, by feeling the pulses properly, taking time. And sometimes they need to take the shoe off. If you are in a heavy jeans, you might not be able to feel the pulses well. So it's a little time consuming, anybody can evaluate. But when it comes to the testing, uh, many of the primary care physicians are busy taking care of blood pressure, cholesterol. They might not have an equipment in the office. So they might not be able to do a peripheral vascular study in the office. They usually send to uh, radiologists or cardiologists. But if they have a proper equipment, the biggest thing is you need a right technician. 
you wanted a technician who is well trained in ultrasound technology and uh, able to show, like as a physician, when we read the studies, we are reading the images that's shown to us by a technician. So if the technician gets the good pictures in front of me, I see the pictures well. So if you have a technician is not well qualified, technicians do it in certain locations. That's where it gets information all gets, then you ended up having another test, another test, another test, four tests, and finally say you don't have anything. <laughs> so the right, right place is the right equipment, right technician. That's the key. And any physician can handle that as long as he knows what test to order. The question is, is the ultrasound, any general ultrasound, or you need a specific ultrasound? For a vascular studies, you need a specific ultrasound with the vascular software on the screen. And uh, um, most of the time, the, the quality vascular work is done in cardiologist's office. Okay, and radiologists do carry uh, sophisticated equipment, and they do able to answer the answer with the proper utilization of ultrasound machines. But no, no dye involved. No dye. No dye. Uh, the question here is: when when there is a plaque in the artery, when physicians place stents, what happens to the plaque? Um, when people are going through carotids, when, when, when you are stenting the carotid, the plaque debris flies to the brain, causes stroke. So what, what they came up is, when the balloon is inflated, you have an umbrella here. It's like a net. So when the balloon and stent is going, this umbrella holds off any of the chunk coming from here and snaps it. So it's, an, it's an, like a net like here, like a parachute. And the stent is going, and the plaque is disrupted. Even a small plaque can cause stroke in the brain. So it's all get caught here. And uh, then this device comes out, and when you suck it out, you see the debris inside. So it's an interesting, if, if somebody gets a carotid stenting without using that umbrella, Medicare does not pay them. You have to use the umbrella to prevent a stroke. Well, because the used to be great concern over the embolism. Right, but now it is a must for the brain. For the heart, the physician's choice at the time of deploying the stent, if he sees the loose plaque, he will use the distal protection device. Uh, many times what we see, small debris still flies to the heart muscle. Good thing is small, tiny capillaries, heart muscle can withstand small debris. The goal is not to, but, but for a brain you must. For the heart, depending on the situation. For the leg, good thing is the stents are so big, they almost push all the plaque into the wall. And, uh, and it's a metal jacket, right? So it, it, it holds the plaque to the wall. So the same thing when you're deploying the valve, which I had the procedures yesterday too, the biggest concern is all the calcium on the valve flying to the brain. So they do not have an umbrella protection when you're deploying the valve. So that's why 10% risk of stroke. So none of the patient yesterday had a stroke. So first two cases, we don't know. We'll know as the time goes. Yes and no. Can you open a 100% clogged artery? 100% clogged artery, if you have a nice collaterals from the other side, in the heart, if it's one artery is 100% closed, the other side gives a nice collaterals. It's almost like a bypasses, auto, we use the word auto bypasses. You made your own bypasses to the artery. And we grade them, grade one, grade two, grade three. Grade three is good, you're in good shape. Grade one is not good. So if it is a grade one, and people are having a lot of chest pain, they're playing golf, they're having chest pain. They don't have a grade three collaterals. That time, the goal is to open the artery. Because it's 100%, it's technically challenging because you are pushing the wire in a 100% artery. You can perforate the walls. 
So you technically you try, but you don't be too vigorous on the arteries. You try gently. If you can open, you can open. If it is a fresh clot, in the sudden heart attack scenario, if it is 100%, everybody who comes with a severe chest pain, 100% clogged artery, it's all a fresh thrombus. It's like a little soft blood. That one is easy to open, and you must open that. You must, otherwise the muscle gets damaged. But if it is 100% is a chronic, which you clogged 10 years ago, no need to go after it if you had made your own collaterals. That's the reason in the legs when you have a peripheral vascular disease, I forgot an important point is we tell all the people to walk more when you have problem. When you're walking more, you're making those collaterals, those auto bypasses to grow more. You're letting them work more. So even though you get a pain, you walk a little bit more. So you walk another minute after the pain. Next time you walk two minutes after the pain. You, you walk until the pain is a little bit unbearable. By doing that, what you're doing is you're opening the collaterals from grade one, moving to grade three collaterals. <laughs>